Um, although this presentation probably should be called Poly.Jacardi uh, E on the Graal VM. So how many know that uh, Java E is now Jacardi E and has been donated to Eclipse? Great. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you have worked with, checked out, or checked out Graal VM before, before this presentation? One, two, three. Okay. Um, so I think this is actually. Um, Yes. Get closer to the mic. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm just used to wandering around. This is going to be a little tricky today. Um, so I think this is actually very exciting technology, especially what Frank just said before I started the presentation about the question about all the machine learning is in Python. In this presentation, you'll actually get to see some of the new approaches for actually leveraging that stuff from the Java ecosystem. Um, so this technology, I think, probably is actually going to revolutionize um, uh, Java development and the, in the VM space. And it's, it's, when I've, I've sat through the technical presentations as to how they did it, the first question in my mind is, why didn't anybody do this 10 years ago? The approach that they took. Because I think it's really novel and, and really interesting. So this is going to have, a, I think, a huge impact upon the Java ecosystem uh, going forward. Uh, so the first question, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is what is Graal VM? Uh, Graal VM is an open JDK distribution from Oracle. Um, currently, it's based, I think this is slightly out of date, it's Java 8 update 221 or something like that, whatever the most recent flavor is from Oracle. Um, I actually just updated it, I think, two weeks ago on, my, on, on this laptop. Uh, the Oracle, with this distribution, the Oracle technologies are not included, so stuff like WebStart or anything that was Oracle specific that's on part of OpenJDK is not included with the Graal VM. Um, there are two editions of it, uh, Community and Enterprise Edition. And there's actually some very good presentations out there that are done by the Graal VM people where they go over the differences between the two, between the community and the enterprise edition. Uh, the primary difference between the two of them is actually performance. The enterprise edition has some things that I guess have patents on it where it's not being released into the open source community. It's not the case where they purposely slowed it down so you go for the enterprise so that you have to pay for the enterprise <laughs> edition. The performance of the community edition is actually better than you would see in Java or with some of the other technologies that I'm going to cover in this presentation, so in some cases quite a bit. Um, Graal VM enables polyglot development on the Java platform, so it allows you to run JavaScript, Python, R, Ruby, C, C and C++, etc., as well as other languages. Um, I believe in New York they always cite um, Goldman Sachs part of one of their proprietary in-house languages to run on top of Graal VM, and that's cited as one of the successes. Um, also, Twitter is now running everything on Graal VM, so every message that you send over Twitter is going via Graal VM ultimately. So, and they were on Graal VM before it was even released publicly, or there was a production release. Um, in addition to running multiple languages, kind of there's two forks of this. You can also generate native statically linked executables. Um, so, some people are excited because it gives you the ability to do public cloud development on the Java platform. Other people are excited, excited in that it gives you the ability to generate natively statically linked executables, which have the same start characteristics as a native application, right? Um, so this is where the uh, Quarkus comes in and some of the other things, because now this allows you to write code in Java and better play in, like, on the AWS Lambda, where you're doing functions as a service, because you get the instant startup time. Um, there is no JVM. You end up with one executable that's statically linked. So there's nothing else with it, and you can deploy that up in the cloud, and, you know, you get very good performance and start. It's native code. It generates native code. There's nothing else other than that executable that you need with it. So there's really two different approaches, two different things that are getting people really excited. So some, some are excited for the polyglot. Others are going off onto the cloud stuff for the native stuff. And in that regard, it kind of allows Java to now play in um, functions as a service space effectively, um, where it wasn't doing very well previously. Um, and also, it's a direct point home, this is a drop-in replacement for the JDK. So you can download and use the Graal VM in your normal, everyday development. Um, there is no, I've, I've run all of the software stack that you know, I work with and stuff that I prepare for presentations, etc. So everything I run on top of the Graal VM, I've never had trouble with it. It is an open JDK distribution. And it's only if you decide to use the additional features that you're actually using them. So by default, it is an open JDK distribution. It is a, a full drop in distribution. Um, now, it's gotten a little confusing over the last couple of years with all the different open JDK distributions out there. So we, of course, have the one from Oracle, which um, there's licensing changes. So basically, either you have to pay for long-term support or you have to stay on the most recent release, right? Um, and the, all these other distributions have popped up. In addition, there's the SAP machine, uh, Liberica, um, which evidently has quite a few of the former uh, developers that worked on the JavaFX side, such, I think was a former 
or of a lab or something like that. Um, so quite a few people ended up there. The one that uh, Frank mentioned with Azul Systems. Uh, you have OpenJ9, which is not technically a licensee, so it hasn't passed the TCK yet. OpenJDK, adopt OpenJDK, of course. So you've got many different ones to choose from. So what makes Graal VM different than all of them? What makes Graal as an OpenJDK distribution different from all of these? Um, and this is, of course, very confusing as, as for this. So what makes Graal VM different is that it allows you to, to gives you support for all of the additional languages that I mentioned on the first slide. So it, it allows you to write code in JavaScript, R, Python, Ruby, etc. It has a different JIT compiler, um, which I believe they're integrating into the newer versions of the Java going forward. Um, it can generate, as I mentioned, native images. And it also has got this concept called isolates, which allow multiple VM instances in process. Um, this one, I think, could actually have beneficial to Jakarta E and uh, container-based technologies going forward because you could have completely isolated applications within the VM. Your existing application servers, whether they're Spring, Java E, or OSGI, they're using class loader-based mechanisms for isolating code, right? It's not an actual hard isolate. And with the isolates, this also means that if uh, the C++ program crashes, it doesn't take down the entire process. So this allows you to now use some of the additional languages in C++ code within your code, and if that code blows up, it doesn't take down your entire application with it. Um, now, why Graal VM? Um, well, interop with other languages is painful and has a high impact. Um, I've heard that when they developed JNI, JNI was purposely made hard so that you could write <laughs> as much of your code in Java as possible. Um, that, was, I, that was an actual quote, I think a quote from somebody at Oracle that actually said that, um, formerly at Sun. And also, the, the process API is painful. So if you've ever written code that tries to use the process API to launch something that then reads the result back, it kind of becomes like a Goldberg machine, you know. OK, that, that didn't quite fail. The path didn't work out right. Variables weren't right, you know, whatever. Um, so that's extremely painful. So those two are, are extremely painful. Uh, Nashorn can't keep up. So quite a few people, when they came out with GraalVM, you know, immediately said, well, they're killing Nashorn because they came out with GraalVM. And that's not actually the case at all. Um, at DevOps Belgium last year, I, I actually asked uh, Mark Reinhold that, that question. It was like, you know, did you kill Nashorn because of Graal VM? And it was actually, I knew what the answer was technically, but I just wanted to get the, the official answer. And the reason why is that um, Nashorn was developed, you know, practically, I think, 10 years ago, before JavaScript was really evolving, before, you know, every six months there was a new JavaScript release. I think we, you know, we have JavaScript releases every year. If you look through most of the, the 2000s, JavaScript wasn't changing. The language was not changing with additional features. Now JavaScript is constantly changing, where every year we have a new, you know, ECMAScript 2016, 17, you know, whatever. So there's a new release every year, and everyone's, you know, transcompiling and doing all the rest of it. Um, but the challenge with Nashorn was what they were doing was they were taking JavaScript and converting it into Java Python, right? Which is extremely limiting because, you know, some of the new constructs that they're adding into JavaScript are hard to represent in Java bytecode. So now the Nashorn team has to try to keep up. And then on top of that, complicating things further, because most a lot of the people that are now doing JavaScript development are using Node, right? And you've got native plugins for that. And Nashorn doesn't solve that problem at all. So there's no ability in Nashorn to use something, you know, some Node.js code, because Node.js is a very specific runtime that allows you to plug in native things. And that's where all, you know, a lot of the, the extensions come from, is a lot of them use native code. So Nashorn is dead on arrival with that. So it's got two problems. It can't handle native extensions, its performance wasn't that great, and um, it was better than Rhino before it, and um, it, it can't keep up with the, the JavaScript language changes. It would require the team constant, you know, the team constantly, you know, trying to deal with that, trying to figure out what's going on with it. Um, so that's, that's the, the reason behind Nashorn. And then Java, Java can't effectively currently compete in uh, serverless very well. Uh, the startup time is too long for the JVM, um, and the image size is too large. So if you've ever tried running something up on a a AWS Lambda, um, I think there's a presentation I did a while back where I compared, you know, a Java versus JavaScript. The JavaScript started up in a minute amount of time and used up a small front footprint. You know, the Java JDK installation is what 300 some odd megs. Um, it requires at least 64 megs of RAM, you know, of memory to start up for your basic. The basic defaults, I think. So it's much more expensive to run up in, in serverless. And you had all these tricks for like, you know, pulling your serverless function to keep it up and running, you know, to keep it warmed up so you wouldn't have to pay that penalty. Um, now with a native image that comes with Graal VM, Java can actually effectively compete in that arena. So you, you get something that has, you know, it's, you know, native startup times, you know, in a, a small memory footprint and a small disk footprint as well. 
Um, so that's why you know, it's, it's, that's where you know raw VM and the corpus. If you haven't checked out corpus, um, check that out because it's actually leveraging raw VM. So it's opening up a whole you know, whole bunch of new opportunities for the Java ecosystem that we didn't have before. Um, now the raw VM overview. So I've gotten we have our traditional languages up at the top, Java languages up at the top that it runs, Java, uh, JavaScript, Ruby, R, Python, and C++. And then it's embeddable, so it's embeddable within the OpenGDK, um, runs from Node.js. Um, they are embedding it in the Oracle database, which will allow you to run all of those languages, and you can also run it standalone. Um, now the component, the GraalVM components, you have the GraalVM compiler, which is a just, just in time compiler, um, implemented in Java, so it's not implemented in native code, like, uh, which is what the, the Java C2 is implemented in native code, so it's actually very hard to deal with. So this time around, the, the, the just-in-time compiler is implemented in Java. Um, the native image component, um, which basically does ahead of time compilation, that produces a, a binary image for your application. Uh, the Truffle framework, which allows you to implement additional languages on top of the Graal VM. And so as I mentioned, OpenStack supposedly was able to do in two weeks port one of their internal languages to running on it. Um, it was one of the cases that cited. cited. But this allows you, and there's an active discussion going on, to port other languages to it. So if you are, you know, you want to port, port COBOL to run on the JVM, you can now easily do that. Um, or if you want to do something, um, the one that's uh, big in the healthcare industry, which is uh, mumps, um, you know, it opens up other opportunities. So now you can take domain-specific languages and, and run them on top of Realm and get some significant performance benefits as well. Um, and also instrumentation support, so it has a language agnostic debugger, profiler, heat viewer, etc. toolchain um, that they're constantly expanding. Um, additionally, there is the Substrate VM, which is the head of the, so the, the names of the pieces. So the Substrate VM, if you're looking at the documentation, is the head of time compiler. Um, that's a link up there. It has a separate uh, GitHub project. So the Rel VM is basically a um, umbrella project, and you've got multiple sub-projects underneath it. So you've got the Substrate VM. Um, Sulon, which is the high performance LLVM bit code interpreter. Um, so it's, it's an overarching project, and you got sub projects with, within it. So it's not just one gigantic project, there's actually sub projects within it. Within it. Um, now, at runtime, you've, uh, sorry, in terms of your development, you've got the runtimes, um, which are either Hotspot, the JavaScript uh, uh, interpreter, J, uh, the compiler, etc., the libraries that go with it, and then a set of uh, utilities um, uh, with it. So these are basically macro level pieces. So you'll install the, the JDK with it, you'll have libraries that you'll add to your class path for doing your development, and then you have some utilities. So you have like a, a JavaScript editor, the Ruby editor, etc. cetera, REPLs, um, that you can then go into and run stuff. And there's also the uh, GraalVM updater, which is how you install additional extensions to it, because some of the languages don't, aren't installed by default, so it's small. The default image size doesn't include things like uh, R, Ruby, uh, Python. You install those afterwards. So it's kind of a, you download it and then you run the installer, you pull down the other, the additional pieces, the additional languages that you want to use. And so, you know, the, the question with the RealVM is why do we need non JVM languages? Isn't Kotlin, you know, Ruby, etc. enough? Because we have, you know, this gigantic ecosystem of languages on the platform. We've got Scala, Kotlin, the new, uh, new uh, fad one. And if we look at the number of libraries that, that are out there, um, um, Java, so the Java packages that are doing a rough calculation, rough analysis of uh, Maven Central versus uh, the MPM registry, etc., and the other ones, and not including C++, uh, if you're on, only developing in Java, you're limited to only 30% of the open source stuff that's out there roughly, right? That doesn't include C++ or the C or some of the other languages with it. So if you look at you know, the number of packages that are available in Node, Python, and R, what GraalVM is it gives you access to all of the other libraries and then all of the other languages. Um, which means that if you're doing any of these things, now not all of these things work yet on, on GraalVM. Um, I the Python support, they're still working on that. So TensorFlow doesn't quite run yet on GraalVM, but eventually it will, or that's their goal eventually, is to get everything up there and support it. But eventually you'll be able to run you know, um, <coughs> all of these libraries, uh, NumPy, I believe, does work right now. Um, you'll be able to run all of these libraries on the Graal VM with Java code. So you'll be able to hop between Java code and TensorFlow code. Right? You'll be able to use it within it. You won't have to switch languages because you want to use AI. 
because your your one group is working with TensorFlow, you'll be able to leverage that within the same JVM and wrap it. Use your JVM constructs and put your tensor, uh, logic that's working with TensorFlow. So it opens up a whole host of new opportunities that didn't exist there before. So you know, in this case, uh, one of the demos that I'm going to go over today is I'm actually going to front a Java EE application with uh, Express, Node.js Express. Okay. And also why Polygon is because some of the, you know, some of these other languages have specific niches, right? So if you're doing statistical stuff, it's much easier to do that in R or Python than necessarily in Java. There are more libraries available in those languages. And like statisticians will know the other language is not necessarily Java. Java is not necessarily the best language for doing something that's like, you know, that involves computations. Um, there's been times in the past where I've had to implement some short stats functions at work. Right, you know, where it's you know a little bit more complicated. If I was implementing something in R, it would be a piece of cake, right? So there would be a library for that. In fact, at one point, I'd implement one stat function, had written the unit test myself, and then six months later, determined, discovered that I had made a n minus one bug in the code that nobody had caught. Right? And if I was using something over in R, I wouldn't even have had to have written that code because it was you know provided by the language. And so these other languages, especially like R, have special constructs for dealing with. You know, for dealing with statistics, and it's much easier and more natural to do it there. Um, so, you know, the right tool for the right job. Um, so, some FAQ questions uh, with Gravium. Um, so, can Java already run JavaScript, Python, Ruby, etc.? Um, you know, Python, JRuby, etc. And yes, but with lots of limitations, because with Gravium, you're getting all of the native extensions. So the idea behind the Python support is that you're going to get all the Python libraries that are out there. You're not just, in the case of Jython, Jython is just the ability to write Python code and run it on the JVM. It doesn't give you access to the third-party libraries. The same thing with the JavaScript. You get access to the Node libraries, right? So you're not just limited to um, you know, just the language constructs. If you're writing code in, you're not going to write code in Python just because you like the syntax necessarily, right? You're usually writing it in there because you have you know, access to certain libraries or there's a reason why you're doing it. And so that's what Graalvium allows you to do, is it allows you to leverage the actual applications and libraries that go with them. Um, was Nash running killed because of Graalvium? Um, I forget I've already answered the question, but no, it was architectural reasons. And as soon as JavaScript began evolving quickly, the writing was on the wall that Nash was going to be dead and then we wouldn't be able to catch up. Um, native libraries, what's wrong with JNI? Well, it's very challenging to actually work with. Um, it is hard to use to use JNI libraries. Um, is native client related to JLink? Um, so on post Java 9, we have something called the JLink, which allows you, to, using the module system, to create a JVM image with your application and your modules that make up your application that just includes the JVM dependencies that your application actually uses. So you can get your, you know, the image of your application done to something very small, right? Something like 35 megs. You know, small. I think I have some examples of that. Um, uh, J, however, JLink requires that your entire application be modularized as well as all of your third-party dependencies, right? And then the other, um, and, and that's extremely challenging. And also, it does not generate a native image, so you still have to wait for the JVM to start. Up. So JLink, while it's kind of related, kind of similar to native client, in that it's giving you a small you know, compact representation of your application. JLink is still giving you a JVM that has to start up. It's still requiring Java code. It's just smaller because it's only including the modules that make up your application. And it also requires that your application and all of its third-party dependencies be fully mod be fully modularized with the Java 9 modularization system. Um, with Graalvium, can I leverage native libraries? Uh, yes, you can. Um, there's actually a really good blog that I'll cite at the end of it. It's in Russian. Um, it is how to use the SQLite database, the C APIs for SQLite database from Java. And so that's been the, the, the best example so far of something that I've seen where you're trying to use like an open source uh, C API to go against something. Um, the code is actually very, I mean, you can read the blog. The blog is all in Russian. Google Translate does a pretty good job, and the code samples are all pretty straightforward, so you can actually follow along. Um, does it require a commercial license for production? The answer is no. So you can use the community edition in. Um, in production. Uh, the only difference is uh, performance between the two. Uh, what platforms are supported? So they're most, um, the platforms that they're mostly supporting right now are Mac and Linux. They are working on Windows. Um, I haven't checked recently to see how far they are along on the Windows support. Um, last year when I was at DevOps, I said, when are your Windows, when are your Windows machines going to, when's the Windows support coming out? And they said, well, um, 
uh, the, the order of Windows machines had just arrived and we thought they'd have it done by the end of the year. It was last November. And that was the grant done by last year. So I think it turned out to be a little bit more work than expected. Um, do existing Java HRDE containers run on Graal VM? The answer is yes. So you can run all of your existing code on Graal VM with no change to it. it. It looks just like a JVM. It is an open JDK distribution. It just has these additional features if you decide to use them. So Graal VM possibilities, what does it allow you to do? So it allows you from Java to directly invoke R code, directly invoke Python code, invoke Ruby code, JavaScript, C, and C++ code. So it allows you to invoke all of these languages. Right. It's pretty straightforward. Now things get a little bit more interesting because you have to kind of flip yourself, flip your thinking around with Graal VM. Um, with Graal VM, you don't have, your starting point doesn't have to be Java. So you could have an application that is primarily a Node.js application that wants to use some Java code and then wants to use some R code, right? So the entry point doesn't have to be a Java application. It can be one of these other languages. So all of the languages are basically first-class citizens with Java, right? So, so flip your thinking around with RALVM. It's not just an open JDK distribution where you're going to be writing a Java application. You could be developing an OJS application and you want to use a Java library, right? So say you're developing an OJS application and you need to talk to a um, uh, a CAS server or something like that, use like the CAS API or something like that for authentication. You can now use that from within, within Node.js, you could call into the Java code. Or if you're writing some JavaScript code, you're a Node.js application and you want to use big decimal or some of the numeric capabilities of Java with JavaScript Max, there you go, you can use it. Now you could also have a C, a C application that needs to invoke some R and the R code uses some Java code, right? So your primary thing is a native application that uses R and Java. So don't think of this just in terms of, you know, I'm writing a Java application and I want to use some little JavaScript code. You know, this gives you the capability from these other languages to use Java in them. So if you have an existing application that's C and you'd like to use a Java library, now you can. Um, same thing with Node, you know, Node.js. And you might, and with these examples here, you might not even have Java on the Mac. You might have a Node.js application that needs to use R. Right? So this is not just a Java you know, going forward, this is not just something that's available to Java developers, this is everyone. So if you're writing a Node.js application, you need to use some R code and you need to access to a Ruby uh, gem, you can now do it. Um, so Graal VM uh, plus Jakarta E, um, well, it expands the, the uh, Jakarta E uh, ecosystem quite a bit. There's nothing specifically in Jakarta E that benefits from it, but it does open up the opportunities for changes in arc and enterprise architecture. Um, so, for example, you know, we could have, uh, if you're developing large applications that have to talk to something that's in Python or JavaScript, you know, you, you can bring it in-house with inside the JVM. Now. now you don't have to execute it, you don't have to have it running on a separate box or a separate process. So if you had different things, you know, you kick this over to this other process to process some data or to do some analysis and then it comes back, now you can pull that in-house within the same JVM for your enterprise application. Um, also, it opens up, which nobody's taken advantage of yet, is the ability to use the same same code server side and client side, right? So we have bean validation right now on the Chicago DE side, which you know we annotate our pojos with to enforce that the data before it goes off to the database, right? But then you have a separate set of JavaScript code running on the client in the web browser or in the, on the mobile phone that's implemented in another language, and you have to keep those two layers in sync field lines, etc. So now this opens up the possibility that we could have a validation framework that both runs on the browser and runs on your server, right? So it allows you, you would have to implement it in, you know, annotations for bean validation and then JavaScript over in your, you know, a reactor Facebook or um, Angular application. And also eliminates the, you know, the clunky language interop. So there was, previously there was an interop stuff between R and Java and that stuff was an absolute nightmare to work with. Played around with it and tried doing some proof of concepts with it, and the stuff would crash on a regular basis. Um, it was single thread and it was a complete nightmare to work with. Um, so ultimately, it simplifies the runtime architecture and coordination between them. Um, so, so we've got different opportunities here with Graalvim. So we can actually take one of the examples I'm going to show today is a Node.js application fronting a Jakarta Java EE application running running inside of Pyera. Now, for simplicity, I'm just, um, fronting. IR micro. I should note that if you want to use um, no, if you're going to use the Node.js stuff, you have to have Node.js be the entry point, right? So you can't have Pyera start up something that's Node.js 
because Node.js has its own threading. Um, JavaScript doesn't have a memory model. And um, it's basically single threaded, which means that it has to be the guy that starts up and then invokes stuff, right? Because you can't have multiple threads reaching into the um, Node.js one from the outside. So that's kind of a, that's one of the limitations, just to be aware of that if you want to do the Node.js stuff. You can't have an existing Java application that calls up into Node.js. You can do JavaScript, but if you want to use NPM modules, etc., you have to be you have to start with Node.js first. You can also have Jakarta E, Jakarta e application that um, you know, uh, uses R and C code. Um, now, installing GraalVM is, is pretty straightforward. It's just an open JDK distribution, so you download it. Um, they have Docker containers that are available. And so you can either run it on Docker or install it on your machine. It's fairly straightforward. Just pick the community or enterprise edition. Uh, the recommendation from the GraalVM guys is to always download the enterprise edition because you can use that free for development. And then you know you could make the decision between the community edition and the enterprise edition later, you know, for what you do in production. Um, installation is straightforward. You download the tar file, unzip it. If you're on Mac, you put it in the Java virtual machines. Um, I usually use on um, my development box. I use JND, JEND uh, for switching between the different Java versions. So and that supports making sure like Gradle and Maven and, and all the tool chains are aware of the different versions that you know can correctly work with the different. Java version, so it has plugins for each of the Java build tools, which is the reason why I like it. Um, we also need to set the Growl home in the variable. And the thing to realize is that because GraalVM is going to download and install third-party pack additional packages, you don't want to install it necessarily as root. Um, so for a while there, I think they removed from the website, they had a download installer that you could run. Um, if you ran that installer, then you wouldn't, you know, it was actually kind of hard to install the uh, third-party languages. So in terms of using it from your Maven build, so you get access to the libraries, um, I always use the uh, Maven toolchain, so I can you know control which version of Java my, my project. So I can specify for this project I'm using GraalVM, this other project I'm using Java 13, this other project I'm using Java 11 because I'm developing on multiple different versions of Java now that we've moved to this fast release cycle. So if, you have, if you're not using it, I recommend that you check into the Maven toolchain. But I set up my Maven toolchain with um, Uh, pointing to the Graal VM installation, um, and then in uh, this is the output from JEMV. And as you can see, as far as the tools is concerned, Graal VM is just another JDK. There's nothing special about it. They don't detect that there's any difference between it and a regular JVM. So the tool is just the SAS. It's, it's Java version 2.2, Java 8.2.2, 212. The only way that you know that you're actually running Graal VM is in the output. that will tell you that it's there. Right. Um, now, the differences between the JDK and the GraalVM. Um, so, what's removed from the GraalVM is the JavaFX Packager, Java Packager, and JMC. Um, and you have a bunch of new utilities that are added. So, you've got G, which is the updater, um, HSDB, uh, JS, which is the REPL editor for JavaScript, um, LLI, which is the size of the LVM stuff, uh, Node, which is a special version of Node. Um, so, it's not it's not the node that you download from uh, Node.js. It's their implementation, so they implemented all the APIs for it. Um, but it is, and it knows how to launch the JVM internally, so you can write JavaScript code that then starts up uh, uh, Java and R code, etc. Um, and NPM, uh, Polyglot. And then to install additional languages, um, you'll run GU install R, Python, Ruby, uh, native images. And once you install these additional ones, then you get a bunch of other executables in the bin directory of your JDK. So then these show up in your JDK. So now you've got an R interpreter, um, you've got the Ruby stuff, you've got the, the native image stuff, the Truby, uh, Truffle Ruby, etc. So then these get installed. Um, the one comment I will make with this presentation is I discovered about 10 minutes before I started this presentation that I had installed the enterprise, finally installed the enterprise edition because I'd always been using the community edition. And the enterprise edition appears to be limited to things that are stable which means that the Python stuff, because it's not formally released, um, I was unable to install it. So any demos today using Python won't actually run if I switch back to the community edition or some of the more bleeding edge stuff. Um, but this is what you do. So if you're using any of these languages, you just install it afterwards. Um, debugging, so a question always comes up is how do you debug across all the languages? Um, they're actually, they tie in with the uh, Chrome debugger. So you run dash, if you're starting up another JS application, you do dash dash inspect. And it binds to the port, and then you can step through and debug your stuff over in the Chrome. 
connect from Chrome. So it prints out the URL that you copy and paste into Chrome, and you're off and running and debugging your application, and you can step from JavaScript into Java code. And they also have a custom build of uh, JVisual VM for doing performance tuning um, for this um, for this stuff. Um, so they're not they're not only developing Graal VM, they've also pro provided the tooling, so you do have the ability to debug. So if you've ever worked with like Nashorn and tried to step from Java code into the Nashorn code, good luck. You know that that is you know. Um, I have some stuff at work that uses that, and I just end up using debug statements, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, system dot up right now that the console dot logs everywhere to try to figure out what's going on. So um, now you can actually debug stuff and you can use modern tools. Um, I haven't tried it, but I believe you can use Visual. Uh, the other question that comes up is you can use Visual Code, um, the tool from Microsoft, um, to actually debug it as well. And they're actually working more with that. Um, then it's so I showed you the tool chain slide before, and then in your Maven thing you're going to set up that you're you know that you're depending upon. Now you pick the the version and the vendor. So that's what I put in my, my um, I made a toolchain file, and then in my Maven file, I set the toolchain uh, plugin to, to aim at what's in my, my toolchain in the .m2 directory. Um, the other thing is I set up the dependency so it can find the, um, these, these dependencies are provided at runtime, but if you're invoking other languages from, from your Java thing, like you're invoking R or Python or something like that, you're going to need the, the, the jar of libraries and the library of uh, APIs for that. Um, and you also need this uh, path, the system path, um, the Graal SDK. And I haven't come up with a really good solution yet as to how to make that so it's not hard coded in your palm file yet. <coughs> um, this is a change, but if you're developing, if you're just running Java code on top of the Graal VM, you don't need to do this because it's just Java. It's just an open JDK distribution. If you're working with the other languages, then you need to go to need to include. Um, the pointers to the library so that you get the API, so you get access to the APIs in your, your uh, ID. And so this is a simple hello world example. Um, so in this example here, I've got the JavaScript code at the bottom and the boilerplate code at the top, which loads the uh, JavaScript engine, loads the JavaScript file, and runs it and returns hello world. Um, so this is very simple. I have the context builder um, do a context evaluate on my JavaScript code, pass in the URL to the JavaScript code, which comes out of the jar file, and invoke it. And it's off and running. So this is the simplest example possible um, for doing that. So the Grail, a Grail VM API packages, you've got Polyglot, uh, which can contains your, you'll be mostly interoperating with this one for invoking other languages, uh, the proxy for dealing with proxies, and then the simple I.O. package. Uh, most of the stuff I believe is in the, the first one, but it's actually a very simple and small API. Um, so some of the key package uh, classes, the context, which is the context for the guest language, handles evaluating code. The engine, which is the execution aid engine, which enables inspection, so you can find what's going on with your execution code. Uh, source, which is the source code unit to be evaluated. And the value, which is a polyglot value access, access via language agnostic operations. Right, so you have a problem that if you're working with R, you get a data frame back in Java, you're going to work with a value object to then interrogate that and pull out the data, right? Because Java doesn't have this, a concept of a R data frame in it, right? Um, so it provides a, a wrapper API around it for getting at um, the different languages. I should also mention that when you pass the Java object into Python, Python is actually working directly with the Java object. So it's not creating like a, it's not taking and copying it into a Python object, for example. So it actually is um, everything put together. Now, in each one of the other languages, there is this, you have an API in Java. In each one of the other languages, you have an API for talking to um, the, uh, for talking to the runtime and invoking another language. So if you're in R, you can say, OK, like this is similar code to what I showed you from within Java for invoking the JavaScript code. Within R, you've got a polyglot, and you pass in the language code and the, um, the language that you want, the script, you know, the pointer to the source code that you want to actually execute, and you're off and running. So this means that from R you can invoke Java code, you can have that Java code then turn around and invoke C code, 
So you can, you can create a really nice mess. Now, if said all this is possible, I don't mean that necessarily it's an idea, a great idea to have our Java code that invokes R code, that invokes C code, that then invokes Java code, that invokes JavaScript code. Because, you know, although they are providing the tools, I can see that this might be a little bit of a nightmare to maintain. So now you have a brand new hammer, and there's a lot of nails. <laughs> And so if you really want to make Java, if you really want to break job, job security, uh, you can use as many of these languages as possible in your next project. And it's going to be used for all the end, and then use as many of these languages as possible, right? So to try to replace it, you have to find somebody that does R, Python, <laughs> JavaScript, and all the rest of it, right? Um, so. Uh, so interoperability between the data types, so you can actually, with over in JavaScript plan, as I mentioned, you can actually instantiate the, the job types. So if you're writing JavaScript code and you need to be decimal now, you have access to it from your, within your JavaScript ecosystem. Um, R, they have special support for uh, the buffered image class. So over in R, you're generating a lot of plots, right, the graphs and everything like that. So you can get them back as an AW as a buffered image, which you can then convert, render, send on screen. Uh, there's some examples out there um, in the, the R in the <coughs> examples for R where they're actually taking and um, uh, uh, in a EE I think it was a Spring application where they are returning back graphs that are, that are then from the Spring application get rendered in the web browser. Um, same thing for Python. Um, now there's a header file for the C, C++ stuff, which allows you to then, from the C++ stuff, invoke the other languages as well. Um, so you just include the polyglot thing, and you've got the command line down, with, uh, down below where I've gone over how to, um, you know, emit the LLVM codes, I passed in the C file, and voila, you know, I've got code that I can then, you know, I can kick off from C code, I can kick off JavaScript code, Java code, R code, etc. There's a link right there. And as I mentioned, there's a really good blog entry for SQLite, going over how to use a SQLite API from Java, which is a C API. Um, and eventually, at some point, I'll get an example together, because like the Gradle build system has got good support for native compilation. So one of the things I think that needs to be done is a really good Gradle example, where you've got C code and Java code, and you're compiling them together to build an SQL, build an application. Um, they've also made it easy so that if you are currently dependent upon Ashhorn and you need to get off of Ashhorn because it's deprecated going forward, they've, made, uh, they've supported the API. So if you're running on this, um, you can actually have it use the, the Growl GS. You can use the, the Ashhorn APIs, except have it Growl VM do the execution. Um, with that, um, and before we get into that, just just to mention. Um, this presentation is mainly talking about presentation where we go over this stuff. There's some Growl VM presentations by the Growl VM guys where they go over the performance characteristics of Growl VM. And so Growl VM running R code is actually much, much orders of magnitude faster than R itself running with its own um, uh, native virtual machine environment that, that, that R provides, right? So their implementation, their, their runtime that they're providing for executing, it actually gets better performance and the performance for Python, etc. And they have a performance breakdown of you know the difference between performance between community and enterprise edition, um, you know, and between all of these languages. And the performance is extremely good if you look at some of the, the, the data that's out there. They've done an extensive amount of benchmarking. So any questions about benchmarking and how's the performance, go look at some of the GraalVM presentations that have been at, given at conferences recently, and you'll see that there's a, there's a wealth of wealth of data out there right now on performance, where the performance numbers are all really good. Okay, so for the first example I'm going to demonstrate is a Chicago E application running on Hyera Micro. Uh, Hyera Micro is a Java E uh, server. Basically, Hyera, if you're not familiar with Hyera, it's a distribution of Glassfish. Um, it has commercial support. Um, and Glassfish is very well architected so that you can create an Uber jar one jar file that's the complete application container. Um, prior to the, many years ago, this was the Sun application server, so it became the reference implementation and is now um, an open source thing since the, the Oracle acquisition. Um, so it's a fully functional, fully passing the TCK Java EE server. And so what I've done is I've implemented a function in each language that accepts a parameter, returns a message. I use a warm-up bean um, to warm up the servers because each one of the languages you have to kind of like start a context for it, right? And sometimes that can take some things. So I use a startup bean to basically warm up all the languages so that when a request comes in to execute a particular script, it's already warmed up. 
in the languages that the demo supports, or are supports all the languages that are that are available, are JavaScript, Python, Ruby, and C. Now, for this demo, I actually just just discovered before running those running the Enterprise Edition, so I do not have a Ruby and Python installed, so I won't be able to demonstrate those two today until I switch back to the, until I switch back to the Community Edition. Um, so just be aware of that. So we have a little bit of code. Set the font. Okay, so I could kind of base it. Um, so this is the, of course, the comments about the code, but this is the main warm up. There's a warm up being that executes the startup, so this starts it up. And then I've got a function that I call from each, uh, there's a drop down, so depending upon which language you choose, it executes one of these methods, which causes an execution of one of these other languages. <coughs> the C code is over here. This is a C code that I'm executing. As you can see, I'm just calling the function to execute it. And the, I have a shell script. It does the compilation. I copy the executable, the, the output um, compiling the native code over into my class path so that I can easily find it. And I can call it from, from the code, and then I start up like grab by or micro and I start up the code. So let me demonstrate this application. Actually, I think I have it already running. Example is a little bit more exciting. I have fronted a Express Node.js app. I've, ex I've fronted uh, a Java EE application with an Express Node.js application. So if you aren't familiar, Express is a web framework for uh, Node.js. Um, it's very easy to develop web applications doing this. So whenever somebody says, well, you know, why would I use Java EE? It's so much easier to use just to implement something in Tomcat. I always say, well, have you seen the Node.js, some of the Node.js stuff like Express? For how easy it is to bang out a simple application. Um, so in this demo application, Express calls into Pyro Micro to invoke Enterprise Java Beans. Um, this is the <coughs> ExpressJS.com. Uh, some sample code for what an Express application looks like. So this is a JavaScript file. So you say that you require you know, Express, you fire it up, and then you register your different endpoints and you know, the data that you're going to send back to them. Right? So this is much easier, in my opinion, than building up a WAR file and deploying it to Tomcat. So you know, somebody says, well, it's you know, why would I use Jakarta E, Java E? It's so much easier to develop something with Tomcat. I always say, well, this one doesn't even require you know, the tool to figure out how to generate a WAR file and deploy it. Um, so this example, over. So this is actually two modules. So we have our right here which says the enterprise job again which says hello we have a wrapper around it and the wrapper is invoked from the express application to call into the container because remember 
the Node.js because I'm running a Node.js application. So the Node.js application has to start up first because Node.js is single threaded. It's got its own memory model and that's the starting point. So you start up the Node.js application and then start the Java application. So the Node.js application starts up the PyR micro application and then talks to the Java code which then does the lookup and finds the enterprise Java beans and invokes them. Um, so as you can see right here in the Java code, the Java wrapper, I start up the uh, Java E container. A PyR micro has an API that allows you to start up and embed it. So I start up the Java, Java E container. I deploy my WAR file. It's running at 49,000, although I don't really care because I'm not serving up any content from it. And then on um, this, then from in here, then I can call in to the Java E application here, I've hard coded and say, okay, you know, invoke this beam. Over in the JavaScript code, server.js, this is my Node.js application, which is going to invoke the EE application. So I'm requiring Express, requiring some device, and set up Express, bind it to port 8088, start my Pyera micro container, and this. And then when a request comes in for slash, I call off into Pyair, I call off and call on the enterprise Java bean to retrieve some text. So this is the simplest example um, uh, for integrating the two of them together. The first, the other things about oops, applications problems. There's a package adjacent to all of your Node.js stuff, starting with the application now. Second, you can see there's some bugger stuff that went by. Here, the Node.js application has now launched the Java EE thing that's embedded within it. And we're now listening on 8080. 8088. Well, from Pyre Micro, so that was the express code, then invoking the container and getting a message back. Um, that example is also up on GitHub. Um, now, the next example I'm not going to run because I'm running the example Python. I'm running a little bit behind the slides. Um, <coughs> this one uses a CDI interceptor to catch, so in terms of integrating the two, they use a CDI interceptor to catch runaway scripts. Um, when you're developing, when you're developing across languages, it's kind of a good thing within the Java, the Java side to try to catch runaway scripts. So there were several times where I had R scripts that kind of went off into never, never land. Um, I don't program in R every day, so I had some funny scripts. Um, now, you can also seamlessly pass entities between these different languages, right? So in this example that I'll, I'll show you the code for, I retrieve some data back from via, J, via JPA from a database, in an in enterprise Java beans, and I pass from an enterprise Java bean, and I pass it off Python code to then manipulate. Python code is actually executing on the Java entity, which means that when the enterprise Java bean returns and the transaction commits, the data gets saved to the database. Yep. So this allows you to nicely interoperate between the different languages. So Python is actually working with the JPA instance that when the, when the Java transaction manager completes it, the data gets flushed to the database. Python code right here. This is just I ran to show that, that it executes. So I have a race participant object that I'm passing in here and basically setting the last name to being the get name type thing. It's just kind of a, a simple example. But I'm working with a Java object in the Python code that I'm calling methods on. And the nice thing is with the Python code is it's not typed, so I can call, you know, set name, like the Python code doesn't need to know about it in advance. Um, but this is a really nice example. I've got within this example here's a and a little bit behind on the time, there's a timeout thing for actually making sure the scripts are bounded and killing things as they run a mock if my Python code goes off into never ending loop or something like that. Um, but look at this example, you can see how you can pass objects between different languages.
So for future opportunities, um, Jakarta EE and Java applications in general are no longer limited to Java. Um, I think going forward, this opens up opportunities. So you could have um, C++, CJB, Singleton Beans, dependency injection into Python code. So this opens up a whole new era of opportunities, I think, for the platform. Um, and then for, for enterprise applications, the ability to use isolates this as a class letter. So you have something that could now survive you know, that could now crash but not take down the entire application. So if you've ever had an application that's dealing with native code, the native code has a bug in it and it crashes in production your entire application goes down. Now, now you can have that and also improve security because now there's no way to see from one isolate to another isolate, right? The class loaders and the you know, tricky things are just you know, kinds of support. Uh, reactive support. So Java, the Java platform has been kind of behind on, on support for reactive programming. Um, you have a Node.js plug, I believe, for MongoDB. You could actually now use that stuff over in the Java ecosystem where you could tie in to, you know, use the, the reactive uh, driver for MongoDB, for example. So it gives you, you can start using reactive stuff that the Java ecosystem hasn't quite caught up with. Uh, so some of the challenges and limitations of this, um, Windows distribution is incomplete. Uh, building and packaging can be a challenge between multiple languages. Um, as I mentioned, Java cannot launch Node.js. Node.js has to launch Java, etc. R and Python support is currently experimental. I've not run into any problems with the R support. The R support is much further ahead than the Python support. Python CP, C API is incomplete. Um, the documentation currently is rudimentary. Um, there are ongoing changes to the GraalVM, although that's gotten much better since they've had the formal release. Um, I ran into some problems running headless with Node.js invoking Java, so there were some little, if you look at, when you check out my code, you see where I ran into a problem. That appears to be only Mac specific problem, not a problem you run into on Linux. Um, for integrating the two on the, the Jakarta EE platform, uh, use warm up context to like, start up a single to warm up for other languages. Um, limit your access to untrusted scripts and monitor and kill runaway scripts. So the ability to do this comes with quite a bit of power, so you have to be a little bit careful to make sure that you isolate and don't allow anybody to arbitrarily upload code. Um, the examples that I have showed in this presentation are available up on VM Starter. Um, if you're um, go up there and Google for it. Um, but this are all the examples that I gave in the presentation. Um, so you can check them out if you're running on Unix box. It'll be very easy to actually run the examples. So you can check out my Python examples and for the other ones. And it's a really good starter sample for the project because everything is all set up for you. Um, resources. Um, the Grail team maintains a Medium blog um, uh, with a lot of good documentation. The uh, Russian post down below is one for wrapping the native library. Um, and if you're not familiar, Gitter is a competitor to uh, Slack. Um, and there's a constant ongoing conversation on the Gitter communities for each one of the different GraalVM technologies. So you can ask questions up there, you know, to, to, um, and there's somebody that's always manning that 24 hours a day. So there's, there's constant discussions going on the communities extremely active. Um, so with that, two more minutes. So if there's any questions, yes? So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned security. So if you have like a buffer overflow in your C code, could you use that to get access to memory in like a Java or R program? Is there um, any sort of sandboxing? Yes, they do. They do sandbox between them. There's the, the ability that when that crashes, they actually detect that so that it doesn't take down your Java application. So when that code crashes, it doesn't take down your Java application. Um, they actually, I think at DevOps poll and they had a demo where they actually demoed it. it's not that specific example, but they did a, like a, a, a they generated an actual crash, right? And showed how it was or showed an example of it being handled. Each of this uh, application or uh, languages, when they execute, they are executing their own processes, or no, nope. no, they're actually executing within the JVM. They've got, uh, or sorry, within the VM. So they've got this VM technology, um, which is it's actually going down to native. So that's how they get the support from the native drivers. I'm not an expert, I'm not familiar with how they implemented it. There's some really good presentations up online with how they explained it. They explain how they implemented it um, with the different languages. Um, but it's not executing R over an R. So it's not like sub executing to the R process. You're actually running within Java. And that's why like the Python support isn't complete yet, because they have to build out the Python, the C APIs for Python. So it is, they are interpreting it as getting, the code is getting run. See, the difference with like Nat, the JavaScript between Nashhorn and what's going on here is that. With um, Nash, when they were compiling, compiling down to Java bit code. In this case here, they're actually compiling down to bytecode. Uh, sorry, not bytecode, into native code for the machine. Okay, I think we're out of time right now. Okay.
Thank you very much.